And when it's recorded, it will be um, added to the ULVLC LibGuide, which I will paste in the chat right now. Um, I've been trying to get those up on the same day, so the one from yesterday is up, um, and I'm hoping to have this one up by the end of the day today. It depends on how quickly Zoom processes it, um, but I know quite a few people like to watch them after the fact if they can't make the sessions. Um, so if you are watching this and recording, welcome, even though you're not here with us in real time. So I don't see any questions coming up in the chat yet, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn things over to Sam to get us started talking about best practices of how-to videos. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am going to assume you all can hear me fine. Um, so I am going to try to monitor the chat in case anyone can't hear me. Sounds great. Okay, cool. So Y'all know me. I'm Sam. I'm the online learning librarian. Um, like Jenny said, we, when I first was hired here, uh, gosh, like three and a half years ago, how time flies, um, you know, it was kind of approached to me like, oh, you know, librarians would like these uh, instructional track trainings. So it started really small, um, just with liaisons, and then we've been kind of slowly expanding it out because of the interest. Um, so I was an instructional technology consultant before this uh, at, the, at UNCG for the School of Ed. So um, it was like a natural fit for me. I used to do these trainings a lot uh, for the faculty at the School of Ed. Um, so I like doing them a lot for librarians. So I'm glad that, like Jenny said, we were able to partner for this. And from now on, you know, while we're still working from home, at least for the summer, I think we'll be doing about one of these a month. Uh, you know, so if you like this one or have ideas, we think the next one for June will be uh, about, you know, creating more engaging virtual meetings, right? Like how to do polls, breakout rooms, things like that. So, but today we're talking about videos, right? So particularly we're talking about kind of instructional videos. I didn't want to call this session instructional videos because I didn't want anyone to think that this was just for people who do instruction to like a classroom or whatever. Um, of course, these kind of how-to videos um, can be for a lot of things, right? So that they can be how-to screencast and they can also be for concepts, right? Like explaining to someone what is interlibrary loan? Um, so um, we're going to be talking about both of those things today. So don't worry if you've never made a video for work. Um, I get, I'm just kind of assuming that most of us in uh, 2020 have at least made a video on our phone, uh, even if it's bad quality. Uh, so it's not, you know, crazy different. But today we're really talking about, like, again, kind of making a video for work, whether it's for a training, whether it's to show someone how to do something in archives, the library, the catalog, whatever you're trying to do, uh, since we will all be um, at least a little more virtual in the fall, uh, you know, this year. So this is, you know, um, though it's a, you know, a bigger group than sometimes comes to trainings, uh, I just wanted to kind of ask y'all, um, you know, have you made a video for work before or did you come to this training like with an idea in mind? Um, so if people want to like share that in the chat, their kind of experience level, or again, just kind of like, did you come here being like, yes, I want to make a video on how to uh, use some tool in the library, um, just so that I can kind of keep that in mind while I'm going throughout this training or we could meet, you know, one on one if it gets, you know, too far off, like the topic of today. Uh, but again, just to kind of get an idea. So uh, Evan says, it's been a while, but wanted pro trips, refresher, great. So Marilyn says, no experience with videos at all, great. Nick says, a long time ago using Camtasia, great. We're going to talk about Camtasia. Shorter ones, and Joe said, I'll be making a lot more, yes. Um, one of the McNair scholars that I work with, and I have an inside joke because I make videos about everything. I have made videos, but I want to make sure they are engaging and reflect best practices, yes, but want to do more, great. Great, so I think I'm kind of getting everyone's experience. So most people have like made a video, but are here because they're gonna be making a lot more. Um, some, uh, Terry said, for personal reasons, but wanna get some better info on editing. Yes, that does sense I'm hunting and gathering a skill set for instruction. Great, so yeah, we're gonna talk about all this stuff, good. So if anyone wants to, uh, get, Beth Ann just kind of said this, you know, kind of like I'm here to get, you know, uh, gather a new skill set for instruction, because again, a lot of us will be doing more stuff online in the fall. Um, but if anyone has a specific idea, like they're like, I really think I'm going to make a three minute video on, you know, how to renew books online or anything like that, let me know and I can kind of throughout the training, 
uh, touch upon that, give you ideas, um, be more specific. Um, I'm happy to do that. And again, I know a lot of you are probably here just kind of like, I just want a refresher. So this is good to know. I'll try to keep monitoring the chat. Okay, so we're gonna just start at the beginning, right? Some best practices before we really start into like, what is the difference between Camtasia and Screencastify and Canvas Studio, all these specifics of the tool. So the first thing when people like come to me in ROI or in other parts of the library and they're like, I wanna make a video. The first thing I always ask is, are you sure? <laughs> because sometimes I think we're trained to be like, yes, video is for me. I'm definitely doing video, but that's not always true, right? There are other formats that might work better for you in terms of putting something online. So um, some questions I ask before we kind of delve into the like, let's definitely make a video. Are, are there other tutorial tools or platforms out there that you could use or adapt? So I'm talking about like, has someone already made a video on how to use Academic Search Complete, where it looks a lot like our Academic Search Complete, where you could just throw in an intro to the slide, not like rip the video online, but again, just link to that and explain to people like this is from a different university, but you know, does all the things I want it to do. Um, and again, ideally, maybe it even has a Creative Commons license on it. Maybe you find it through an OER are repository maybe it's a librarian that you could just shoot an email and be like hey could you could I adapt this for my own purposes at UNCG so I think that's an example of how sometimes we could like work smarter not harder um, instead of you know recreating it so do you need to provide links to the resources right like do you need people to be able to go into your presentation or your whatever you're trying to do and click onto something to go out into something Again, then video is probably not for you because the complication of having to create like hyperlinks within a video is not worth your time. Um, really, you're talking about like these very interactive videos um, using something like SCORM, which like we're not even going to talk about really today. So if you need to provide links to outside resources, if that's really crucial for you, if you need people, students or your patrons really clicking into things, uh, then again, video might not be your deal. Do you need to have that synchronous engagement with a class or training? Do you need to be able to like kind of do what I did, right? Like talk to them in the chat, uh, uh, do a poll, that kind of thing. Again, uh, a video might not be for you. Thinking about a webinar format, a virtual meeting instead where you record it and just make it available for your patrons afterwards uh, could be a better deal. Um, could a textual guide with screenshots work? Um, we're going to talk about this in a second, but um, videos are harder to edit after the fact when something changes. So sometimes a textual guide where you can easily sub in screenshots um, is more accessible, easier to make, and a better option. Um, is it an online interface that might change? Our databases, our catalog, our website, all of these things change often which means if you make a video, you're already putting yourself in a situation where every couple of years, you're gonna have to change it. Even if you're making a concept video, like I made a concept video about, um, you know, for online students to kind of introduce them to the library uh, using Paltoons and animation tool, which I'll talk about. Some of the information that I said in there have changed. So I'm gonna have to like re-edit the whole video or cut it up and figure out a solution to that. So do you have the equipment needed, right? We're working from home still. So do you have a computer with a microphone, a solid microphone where you are very clearly speaking into the computer and access to the internet? Because a lot of the tools we're talking about today are cloud-based and to publish them, you'll have to um, put them online. So a solid internet would also be good. Yes, yeah, so Maggie said, um, I have both sent and gotten emails like that from other librarians, and I would say librarians are always happy to share their content. Yes, I've, a librarian has literally never told me no um, to that. Like, uh, an example for that is that uh, there was a Zotero video that I made that's just like a couple of minutes just to explain, like, what is Zotero? It wasn't getting into the nitty gritty of Zotero, and I liked the format of the librarian at Wake and how he did it with, uh, you know, kind of quickly demoing it. And I told him, I was like, can I just like use your same style, but quickly adapt this to us? And he was like, of course. So it was not a problem at all. Okay, so here's again some pros and cons to think about in terms of like, are you sure you want to make a video? So we kind of touched upon this, um, but you know, videos can be a great way to show something, how something works or that something is broken, right? Again, like click here, do that. You can add call outs, edit, speed it up, slow it down, create animations to show concepts. Uh, there is a lot of free and easy to use software available that we're going to cover today. And there are a lot of options for publishing, right? For streaming it to a large audience, particularly even now, it used to be <laughs> 
years ago that you couldn't put a long video on YouTube, and now that's not even the case anymore. So the cons is, again, it has to be updated or reshot every time there's an interface change. So if you're doing a tutorial on how to use the catalog or how to use the um, whatever libguide that you're on or the um, you know, school website, then you know, if anything changes, right, like interfaces, then you'll have to redo it. There's not a lot of ways to like edit things you know, easily. Uh, so it's just easier most times to just completely reshoot the, the um, video. And unfortunately, we have found with research patrons do get kind of thrown off, even if it's the same concept, right? Like the filters are still over on the left. If it's a different interface, if it looks different, they'll immediately assume it's just an outdated video and not finish it, not listen as much. So you need to close caption all of your videos, period. Um, we're going to talk about accessibility a little bit. And um, I know there's some people in here who do this. It's a time consuming thing and uh, it's, you know, not fun. No one likes to close caption things. Uh, so um, that leads into the last point. It is really time consuming, uh, even for a two to three minute video to edit, to, to do a video, right? So the time you're going to take, so if it's a eight minute shoot, right, of your computer, of you like touring a thing online um, and you edit it down to four minutes, that editing down is going to take you a while. Um, I would say typically for like a four minute video, I would say you're looking at at least uh, three to more hours of work depending on your comfort level. For someone like me who kind of makes a lot of videos, has been doing this for years, I can maybe do one in like three to four and that's like the idea of that I'm not even maybe thinking about later closed captioning it. So it just kind of depends again, but I would definitely give yourself at least a full day if you're just starting it. Yeah, so Maggie said an hour to a minute of content. That sounds about right. Um, and that's again like Maggie and I are examples of like we've been doing videos for a year and it is, um, you know, uh, I don't feel like I'm that that calculation seems pretty correct. Okay, so you've thought it through. You've thought like, okay, this is going to take me, you know, all day long or like I'm going to span this out over a week. Um, so now the thing is you need to, to be able to, you know, really efficiently use your time. You need to think about planning. So even if you're not a person who's like into kind of setting up the stage for this, honestly, like I'm not, I'm kind of like, you know, I'm sure my mother could write you like a novel about this. I'm an impulsive person. So, you know, this is something that I've had to get used to, but it is crucial to what you're doing. No matter what kind of video you're making, you need to write a script or a storyboard, depending on how your brain works. So it could be bullet points, you know, right? But I am actually recommending, again, use my mistakes in the past. Writing out a full script of what you're going to say, even if you veer off from the script, helps you keep you on track. And it also helps you with closed captioning later because you can upload the script as the text, you know, with the grammar, because that's the big thing about adding in, um, you know, closed captioning for a session like this, right, where I don't have a script, you have to add in all the periods, capitalizations, fix, you know, in Canvas Studio or YouTube, where it thinks when I say Canvas, that they're actually saying campus, like things like that is where it gets really uh, nitty gritty. Um, so keep that in mind. So yeah, Jenny says that, uh, she seconds this, I don't usually use scripts for presenting or teaching, but I've learned this is the hard way for videos. It saves a lot of time. Yeah, so like again, I didn't write a script for this session, right? Like I made these slides, I read over the slides, I kind of thought through how I was gonna do this, but I didn't write out any script. But if I was making y'all a four minute video on the best practices of um, how to make a video, I would have written a very detailed script and probably edited it and had it, you know, ideally if you have a printer, like even print it out in front of me while I'm doing it. So you also need to develop learning outcomes for your videos. Similar to a script, that is how you can kind of stay on track. And I have a link to a guide I have about online learning later, which links out to a lot of stuff about learning outcomes if you don't have experience with it. But thinking, learning outcomes, it helps to think about your audience, right? Like who are you making this for? Is it for every patron that's gonna come into the library? Or is it really specific to this one class? If it's a course integrated video, really looking at the um, courses learning outcomes are helpful, right? To again, keep you on track, make sure that you're not uh, going too far off of what you set out to do. Again, with ideally a shorter video. I have made that mistake before where I'm like, well, I, I you know, have this online class and I really want them to learn everything. So I'm gonna make them a 10 minute video, but like they're not gonna watch or listen to a 10 minute video. So, you know, again, focus in and think about what is important 
uh, and learning outcomes help with that. So um, before, you know, now you've written your script, you have your learning outcomes, you've potentially connected to the learning outcomes of your course. You need to practice through reading your script. And um, even if you have time, send it to a colleague or friend to review it, um, to see if it makes sense. There's nothing worse than like taking the time to write a script, uh, recording the whole video, right? And then sending it to a colleague after you recorded it and be like, and then be like, I don't understand this. You know, this doesn't make sense to me. I don't think it really connects to our thing. Or like, oh, look at this big error you made about something about the catalog. It's a bummer. So again, if you have time, um, you know, find a friend and send it to them. And again, have them really like look through it with you. Um, it's again, it's similar kind of to like writing an article or, you know, a blog post or anything. Like having an editor is always a great idea. So um, I'm not going to harp on instructional design because, you know, people teach like full semester courses on instructional design. There's like, you know, obviously like master's degrees in instructional design. Um, but there are, if you get into this, if you're like, man, I love online learning objects, like making tutorials, doing this stuff. Um, and I know some people from like, you know, research, outreach, and instruction are in here and very into this and know more about this than me. I think Maggie and Jenny are both in here and like they are great experts on this, so they can help you as well. But there's a couple of different things you could look at. Backwards de Design, Bloom's Taxonomy, Addy, SAMR Model, and there's many more. Those are just to get started. Um, so a lot of them, again, help you with this whole planning process, right? Thinking about how, who it's for, what do you need this for, connecting the learning outcomes, creating learning outcomes, um, you know, what is your purpose? All of these things that are really kind of crucial to planning. Uh, instructional design, that is what it's there for. So if you are interested in learning more about this, in this presentation, I link to this openly available instructional design chapter that goes through the definitions and models. It has really nice visuals. Um, you know, it's OER, which is great. So like, again, if you are interested in this and want to look at it, here it is for later. So are you working with a team, right? Which again, I think a lot of us are. I, one of the things I like about this library is that it's pretty easy for me to team up with someone and make a video, um, you know. So thinking about that is a good thing. So if you're um, working in a team, I would recommend using Google Docs or another form of collaborative writing tool for your script and for your planning and for like, you know, how you're gonna think it through so that the team can all look at it together and make sure you're on the page. Another tool that's great for working with the team is Trello. Um, it helps you stay organized. You can assign parts of the video workflow. You can assign due dates. You can link to Google Docs, Google Slides. It has like a Google Drive add-on. So Brown has done um, trainings on Trello's before. So I, the link here is to Trello. But again, on these slides, I link to some of his training documents. And you know, um, so if you want to kind of go back through and see his trainings in the past, um, or ask him about it. He knows a lot about it, um, but it's a free tool to use online. It is approved by UNCG. Um, and again, it's pretty easy to kind of at least start playing around with it. So here's an example of a Trello board that we use for the project of the library tutorial revamp. Um, so the tutorials are put into these categories of find, evaluate, use, credit, create. And then we have modules for each category. So here we put the different modules in the categories. We um, tag them with labels on where they go. We can tag them if they're in progress. We can assign people to them. Uh, we can make comments on them. And then we created over on the far right, which you can't see, a link to a, um, sorry, a category called done. So when they're done, we can just like drag them into there so that they're out of our way. And this is so we can know like what's coming up. Um, so these are a lot of these are the ones we haven't done yet. Uh, so it keeps us on track and we kind of know like, oh, okay, I'm not going to start primary and secondary because Jenny's claimed that um, and she'll, she'll be doing that on her own. So again, it's just an example of something you can use if you're like, you know, if like the music library, for example, wants to make a suite of videos and you're assigning it between different people there. So, um, yep, slides will be linked in the link. Okay, so thinking about your pace and length of videos, um, I'm like probably the worst example of this because as many of you who've been in my trainings or like talk to me in person, though I grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina, believe it or not, um, I speak quickly. And uh, I've learned, you know, in my instruction to kind of give my students a heads up and to and, like just tell them like, just tell me if you need me to like go back over something, slow it down. But videos um, are always slower than regular conversations. Um, you, you know, don't have to make it weird where you're like, 
hello, that kind of deal. But you do need to, again, where the script is gonna come in handy, you do need to really like pace yourself, take a breath. The good thing about having videos and editing software is that if you accidentally start speeding up, if you like feel yourself getting crazy, take a breath, pause, right, for a couple seconds, and then start again. Um, same thing where if you like make an error, right, if you say the wrong thing or if you mispronounce something, take a breath for about two or three seconds and start again. This is going to help you in the editing process because it will then in the audio track, which you see in editing, take a dip, right, and then you'll be very clear when you are editing, there's my dip, there's where I messed up. Right, and then you can cut that part off more easily. So taking breaths, slowing down, having a script, all of that is very important to the pace and length. So short and to the point is better than long. Um, the only video that I think I've made while, we're, while I was here that was longer than five minutes uh, was the catalog video. I think it was just like a little over five minutes and with consultation with like Leah and a lot of other people, we decided like, the catalog is used heavily enough and is important enough that we're okay just having it go a little under over and we have cut up versions of it right if people don't want to watch the full five minutes but to really cover everything we want to cover about the catalog we we need a little bit more than five minutes and then another one was a course an online course where i think i did a seven to eight minute video and again that was really course specific it was online but other than that you're really thinking about even if you have a topic that you're like this there's no way i cannot cover this in 10 minutes then you need to start thinking about how are you going to chunk that video up, right? Like what are the different breaks in the video where you can, you know, maybe even record for 20 minutes, but then start chunking it up so that when you publish it, you're publishing three different videos. So that kind of thing. So um, you need to break videos into, uh, I said that, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the chat. Okay, so the look and feel of the video, right? So um, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna give you links in a little bit to some of the resources about um, graphic design, but just in the basic idea of how you want your videos to look and feel, you're thinking about simple, straightforward um, are better than fancy editing. So a mistake I've seen happen with a lot of people, librarians, faculty, students, is that they uh, get a taste of like some Camtasia, which is like the most advanced editing software for screen recordings there is. And uh, they're like, I'm gonna throw in tons of animation, graphics, I'm gonna have like fade-ins, fade-outs, the checkerboards coming in and out all the time. I'm gonna speed up, slow down, just because I can. <laughs> Uh, that is not great instructional design, or, and it can be really distracting to the student um, so or the patron. So the simple and straightforward is always better. And especially if you're just getting started with videos, um, just kind of getting your feet wet, thinking about how you can make a simple, quick how-to video is a great place to start. And again, there's been like articles and assessments and research done about how students in particular, the research is mostly done on students, get pretty overwhelmed at a lot of um, this kind of, again, fade-ins, fade-outs, uh, fancy stuff going on. They would much rather it feel a little bit more casual, right, um, and easy to understand than, again, the fancy stuff. So if you're using graphics, you keep them clean and professional. So I think, again, it's 2020, right, like we're kind of out of the age of, like, clip art and things like that. Um, I'm going to, again, link you out to resources, but flat icons, um, again, these kind of uh, cleaner graphics. Uh, if you're getting images, making sure that they're uh, not copyrighted and that you're citing them. And that includes your icons. If you're using flat icons or icons, um, where did you get them from? Um, and we'll talk about that. You can have a quick cre credit slide at the end of your video, that's typically what I do. And same, I should have said this, um, but I guess it's not like look and feel, it's sound. But if you're getting music, there's tons of music websites out there where you can download like quick uh, three minute, five minute, you know, sound pieces that you can loop, right? And have nice like quiet music in the background. Um, and they're cop you know, copyright free, open to use, but it is best practice to cite them. So at the end of the video, again, having like music by Sam Harlow, blah, blah, blah. So again, uh, keeping that in mind. So you, need, you can combine visual elements. So we're gonna talk about the differences right, right after this slide of like animation, 
like a, you know, again, making an animation of like how something works versus like a screen recording and like the differences and what to think about, but you can combine the two, right? You could have an intro where you're kind of explaining the concept of how something works and then run in, you know, flow that in editing into a how-to video. So I do this often. I think I've seen again, like Maggie and Jenny do it. Um, you can use just something as simple as PowerPoint or Google Slides, get some icons uh, online, and again, have them just move through the slides or animate them within the PowerPoint or the Google Point while you're making a point in your script. Again, it's a nice way to have a visual thing going on in the background, you know, instead of just your voice when you're explaining the concept of how something works. Again, without overwhelming the student, and without you having to like learn a fancy animation tool. Um, even something as simple to use as Paltoons is time consuming and this could be an easier way to do it. So thinking about how you're going to break up the video is um, kind of a nice thing. So here's some things to think about whether you should do animated versus a live action or screencast. So an animated video, right, these like you've seen them all over the place. When I was looking up like tips and tricks of this, a lot of them were like marketing videos. You know, you've seen a lot of those marketing videos of animated people, how to do, you know, how the concept of something. So concept and explaining processes are great for animated. For example, why does the catalog exist? Um, you know, like what is the overall purpose of having a catalog? Having an animated video of kind of like some concepts thrown together, analogies, are great for that. Um, live action or screencast is good for how to's, right? By live action, I mean, you could use that for concepts, right? Like having a students play through a scenario, but screencasts are a lot better for like how to use the catalog filters. Um, so both of them have free software available, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, and both are time consuming to plan and make. So don't, you don't have to worry about those factors when thinking about animated versus screencast or when in your video to use animated versus screencast. So the last thing to talk about before we get into the nitty gritty of the tool is one of my favorite concepts, which is universal design for learning. So universal design for learning is a practice or a concept of thinking about creating, when you're creating online learning objects, when you're creating any kind of instruction, thinking about creating multiple means of expression, action, sorry, action expression, engagement, and representation. So when we're thinking about the part of creating multiple means of representation, that means that having different parts, different elements of your video, or if you're making a suite of videos, doing kind of different things throughout is important, right? So then creating a script with screenshots or linking to an accompanying guide, right? So like if you're doing a video about Scopus, but you also have a live guide about Scopus, it is best practice to, at the end of your video, have a go link or a tiny URL to your guide where you also post that guide in the comments in YouTube. Um, so that is, again, like how to be kind of the most accessible. I know that's more time consuming and I'm not suggesting we all make an accompanying website or a textual guide for every video we make, but if it's a heavily used video, if it's something you're gonna be using over and over again, I would, I would recommend thinking through um, doing that. Okay. So we're about to go into the nitty gritty of creating. And again, as I said, I talk fast. So are there any questions so far? Comments, concerns? Nothing's been put in the chat in terms of questions. Okay. Just do a quick pause. Get some water. And then I'm gonna move on to creating. Which is, again, it sounds like, again, a lot of y'all came for those kind of refreshers. So now that we've thought through the planning of your video, let's talk about the tools to record it and to make it and to do it. So creation tools are, um, I'm really only going to cover free and UNCG supported. Um, so the three that I would recommend to think about, depending on your situation, are screen crap, crap. Ah, screencast or recording your screen, right? Like what is happening on your screen right here? Um, then I would recommend Canvas Studio, Camtasia, or Screencastify. So if you are new to this process um, and, uh, you know, want to just like play around with something that comes with an editor that has an editor where you can add in call outs, um, cut the video up, uh, speed it down, slow it up. 
uh, I would recommend Canvas Studio. So anyone with a Canvas account gets access to Canvas Studio. UNCG ITS pays extra money to Canvas on top of our Canvas subscription. Canvas is our learning management system. Um, and it is a tool freely available when you log into Canvas. So you have to go to the canvas.uncg.edu site. Even if you are not registered for any classes, at every UNCG employee has a Canvas account. So if you've never logged in before, it might make you go through some steps, but um, you know, it's been a long time for me. I don't remember what it is, but you should be able to get through it with your UNCG username and password. And again, there's, you know, library organizations are in there, all that stuff. So once you go on the far left on your global navigation, there's a button that says Canvas Studio. It used to be called ARC. Uh, so if you've been to trainings in the past or heard people talk about it, uh, it's ARC. But they use the advanced editor from Screencast-O-Matic. So if you've ever like dipped your foot into screen recording, Screencast-O-Matic is a freely available online tool that's really popular, particularly between with K-12 educators to kind of quickly make these how-to videos. Um, they do put the logo on it, but again, and I think they have a limit of 10 minutes or 15 minute videos. Um, so you kind of have to get to your point quickly and move on. And then their free editing, you know, uh, thing is just the only thing you can do is cut the ends, like the beginning and the end, not the, anything in the middle. Um, but uh, if you pay $25 to Screencast-O-Matic as like a teacher, I think they have an education account, um, and we would all count as teachers because we have the EDU email, um, then you get like very advanced editing. So some of the things that include, again, are speeding up, slowing down, adding call outs, things like that. So if you want to start, that is where I'd recommend. Because it is an instructor product, uh, it is supported by all of our instructional technology consultants. It's supported by ITS. If anything was being buggy, you could put in a ticket um, through uh, Six Tech is what I recommend. But um, if someone in Eric who's here could chime up and say, I think you could, you know, talk through Discord because it's a UNCG process product. Um, but then uh, that is what I would recommend. So I've heard some people in chat, you've probably seen it. And again, many of you have probably heard of it. But Camtasia is like when you're like getting trained on creating these screen recording videos is like the Cadillac of, you know, uh, screen editing. It's usually what people are trained on. A lot of faculty, when they talk about it, they're like, I want Camtasia. Um, but it does cost money. And UNCG, though we've like approved it for use, we do not have an institutional license. So if you try Canvas Studio and you're like, nope, don't like it, you know, want Camtasia, you'll need to talk to Eric. Um, you know, maybe start a Discord if you want to email someone, um, but like that is something you would have to have installed on your computer. Whereas Canvas Studio works through your browser and then any downloads are like pretty quick and would be approved. Um, it worked like it works fine off campus. You wouldn't have to go in and use. Um, so if you're using your own home laptop, you can still use Canvas Studio. Camtasia has to be installed and updated. It's, you know, a pretty like powerful program. Um, so the other thing is if you don't have a laptop, if you have been working from a um, Chromebook, which I know some of you are, if you have issues with a laptop and are using a Chromebook, what I'd recommend is a tool called Screencastify. Um, it does have a limit of five mini minutes, but if you're just making a quick screen recording of like how to use a database, whatever, it's very easy to use, it's very lightweight, and it allows you to annotate videos. So you can draw on things. Um, and that kind of thing. So I did do a ULVL session where I talked about this kind of stuff for an hour, and I did link to that at the end of this presentation. So I'm not gonna really talk about that stuff a lot more because we have like, this is more of a like overall how to make a video. Um, but uh, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. So another thing, if you're making an animation, we talked about this, but um, you can also, you can use, um, Paltoons. Uh, so Pal there's other versions out there, but I really, my experience is in uh, Paltoons. So you can go to Paltoons and create a free account and they provide you um, with the free account, you have um, limited access to their icons. So they have people who move around. They have, um, you know, you can animate like a, like a globe, things like that. And I can show you an example if we have time at the end of some of the animated videos I've made about library stuff. Um, but they do all of the like kind of swooshing people in for you. They provide you with a script. They give you music to put in the background. 
Um, so the free one has limited access to icons as well as you can only make, I think, up to five minutes, which again, for a concept video where you're like explaining how something works, uh, I would recommend definitely not going over five minutes. Uh, they also have limited export options. They typically want you to put it directly into YouTube. So if you wanted to cut it up, and put it with something else that's a little more challenging. Uh, you're welcome to email me. I have figured out kind of workarounds with that, um, where it keeps their logos and keeps it legal, but it, it's a little more complicated. So again, it's only good for like quick little animated videos where you're just gonna make it animated. And again, it will go straight onto YouTube where you can um, close caption from there. You can also, like I said, use Google Slides or PowerPoint. So you could create put icons within there and then move them around, use the animation tools within there and do it that way. And again, I'll show you some examples at the end if we have time, um, but that's another way to kind of do animations, just a quick little like movements around things. So you can also create interactive videos. Canvas Studio allows you to upload videos you've already made, or again, create videos straight within their tool. You can screen record from there and edit within there. Um, but then Canvas Studio within Canvas for a Canvas class or a Canvas org allows you to have people create discussions around your video. You can have pop-up quizzes in your video, and you can also have a discussion at time point. So someone could say like two minutes into your video, like great point about videos or whatever. H5P is free and supported by UNCG. It's open source. Uh, it's HTML5, so it creates interactive elements um, in HTML5, and they have a video component, which again does um, pop-ups. Um, and PlayPosit works a similar way, um, but uh, I don't think that's UNCG. UNCG supported, so you would be on your own if you wanted to play around with that one. Um, another tool I think is Edpuzzle, but really I think Canvas Studio and H5P does a lot. Um, so if you're interested in kind of doing a more interactive video, you can let me know or that could be another session. Um, so with editing, if you make, you know, Canvas Studio has the editing. So just to make that clear, again, I would recommend if you're like getting your feet wet and starting, you start there. But Camtasia has advanced editing. Um, both Canvas and Camtasia have tons of tutorials online. And unfortunately, I'm not going to like harp on editing in this session. We just have like too much to cover. Um, but if we, if you needed a one on one with me, uh, where we share our screens and work through things, that's fine. But again, also, if you Google like Camtasia, how to cut out pieces, Camtasia, how to add a call out or Canvas Studio um, editing tools, there's tons of guys that are made by these companies that are really good. So another advanced one is Adobe Premiere. Um, so uh, that is one that you could use. I always use Camtasia or Canvas Studio to do all my editing. So I would talk to the Digital Media Commons if you're familiar with Adobe Premiere and really want to learn how to do that. Um, again, that to me is for like pretty advanced video creation where you're like creating like marketing videos and things like that. And again, I think the Digital Media Commons would be a better place to go for that. So we've talked a lot about graphic design, but here are actual things that you could go to and uh, you know make your graphic design easier. So for slides, like I got this slide deck and I think a lot of the slide decks that I've seen with ULVLC from Slide Carnival. They provide you with these decks uh, where you could create, again, your intro, your opening slide, your credit slide uh, through there. And again, it kind of does the graphic design for you. Another tool that's great is um, Canva. I think, again, at this point, I'm sure many of us have used it, but it's free. You go online and it helps you create like handouts, infographic, and slides. So again, if you're looking for a way to do like an opening into your video or an end of your video. Um, I forgot to link to this, but I'll add it in after this. But you know, obviously also the UNCG brand guide, right? Like getting your UNCG graphics in there, um, getting your UNCG colors, manipulating your slides to you know match UNCG is a great technique if you're making a UNCG specific video. So Canva is also great for graphics. They have icons, they have things like that. Um, they also have infographic tools, um, and there's other competitors to Canva that you could try out as well, like Bizme, um, Peak to Chart, like all kinds of things. So I'll add that in there after here as well. And then icons, some good ones are Noun Project, Flight, Flat Icon, and Icon Finder. Um, so now there is an add-on into Google Slides. I don't think ITS has approved it yet. They probably will soon where you could add noun project icons, they're black and white, like straight into your slides. So that's a good tip. But then flat icon and icon finder, I think both of them make you create a free account, but then um, that just allows it so that you can download like X amount for free. And I use it all the time. I know a couple people in here use them all the time and I've always been fine with the limits. Um, and if you really were into it, you can buy like icon packages, but you know, um, 
it's most people are fine without that. Um, yeah, Maggie says big fan of flat icon. Um, so uh, the fonts, uh, if you are like wanting kind of different fonts than what a lot of these templates provide you, again, for like opening slides and videos, closing slides, font squirrel and defont are good. And then I have a link on here to a Padlet made by Maggie, who's here, about digital resource suggestions for many of the resources link. So, you know, a lot of the stuff I just mentioned are linked onto there, plus also some Chrome extensions uh, that will help you kind of make sure that again, it can do color pickers. So like you could find a color on the internet and match your coloring in the video or on slides to that. I think it also has a link on there to maybe a mobile Chrome one. So you could test your videos and make sure it works on a mobile device. So we've hinted at this and we're finally here, but you have to close caption all your videos. So um, typically there's a, two ways that this can be done. And again, this could be like its own session or I'm happy to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. But if you are doing these kind of shorter videos where you have a script, you can um, convert your script into a text file and then upload the text file into YouTube. And then it, cre it creates the timings for you automatically. And then the grammar's there. And really, you very rarely have, you have to do a couple of timing tweaks, but that is like your ideal method. So again, another great reason that if you're making these kind of quicker videos that you create a script. Um, if you didn't make a script or you ended up going like off script where it like really veered from the script at one point, uh, you can use automatic captioning within YouTube, but also Canvas Studios has a captioning tool um, that we have found through like now that we're doing much more webinars and the webinars are an hour and we're putting them online and having to caption them. Um, Canvas Studio is much better. Um, not as buggy, uh, doesn't go out as much, it saves your work better, and it works better, like it recognizes your voice better. So if you're making, um, again, especially longer videos, uh, I would recommend using the Canvas Studio closed captioning tool. And I think Michael might be in here, maybe Marcus and some other people who've played around with it. If y'all have anything to say in the chat, um, feel free. They've been doing a lot of work with these ULVC webinars and webinars I've done in the past, which I, of course, very much appreciate. And uh, they can uh, also ask, you know, answer questions because they have a great workflow set up. There's tons of tutorials, again, online about how this works. Um, and uh, the YouTube ones and Canvas Studio ones both. So again, um, thinking about accessibility beyond closed captioning, ideally, um, even if you don't have um, a, a voice going, right? Like let's say like Powtoons, animated videos, a lot of times they'll have pop-up words right like coming at you or you're using a slide and you you know you're not reading the words um even if there's no voice in the video or there's points of the video with no voice you still need to have captions um, or a link to what is going on um so if you are um a visually impaired person and you don't hear a voice and there's no captions on there you're gonna have no idea what's going on um you know in any way so you still have to provide that. And we have a great accessibility coordinator through UNCG Online who can help you with that. Uh, she's helped us with that for some, video, some concept videos we've made to make sure we're doing it correctly. Um, so uh, if you have any questions about that or make a video like that, um, you can email her. Her name is Melanie Ely. Um, and uh, again, I'll add her information here, but uh, she's a great resource. And then again, remember what I mentioned before about multiple means of representation. Having a company textual guide is a great idea if you have time. So yeah, Michael says uh, CC editing is much easier in Canvas. Yes, and Jenny said she's awesome and responds quickly to Melanie. Melanie is great. I'm glad we, UNCG was able to hire her. Not every university has a full-time accessibility coordinator for our online stuff, um, so it's great. So here are some links, more links um, to guides about video creation and design. So I talked about these tools, but again, an hour to talk about like all things video. Um, we just don't have time to get into the nitty gritty, but these are guides that go into the nitty gritty of graphic design, animated videos and Paltoons, Canvas Studio, screencasting and free screen recording tools. Um, so if any of these things kind of like stood out to you or that's some of the guide you want to, you know, a route you want to take, uh, you can check on that. You can also email me and we can set up a one-on-one -on -one and we can talk through it. I'm definitely happy to do that. Um, and if I don't know, I'm great at, um, you know, that kind of thing. Oh no. So yeah, Lois was saying that the UNCG fonts in a document upload to Canvas. Canvas doesn't recognize them. The document have glitchy looking fonts. 
Ugh, yeah, that's annoying. I think I've complained about this to ITS before that they, and, and not, I, you know, I mean, I don't think it's ITS's fault, but you know what I mean? Like that the fonts that UNCG chose are harder to find. Um, and Maggie points out that Google free fonts that have a similar look to the approved UNCG fonts. Um, yeah, great. Yeah, you should send those along. I'm interested. Okay. So now you've made your video, you've edited it, you uh, have added the CC, or you know, you're gonna think about adding the CC. Uh, now, how do you make it available to your patrons? So uh, you put it online or in a course. So YouTube is where it's at for free and easy to upload. Uh, you could do your CC through there. Um, if you're just gonna do you know, two minute videos, that's a good way to do it. Um, and then um, uh, if you, but if you're working directly with a course, right, and it's very course specific, like you don't really care about people finding it online through YouTube, um, then I would actually recommend just uploading it directly into Canvas or Canvas Studio, like bypass YouTube altogether, um, because like if it's very course specific, you know, don't bother, don't, you know, overload their servers. So thinking about findability, um, linking your videos at multiple points of needs is recommended. So uh, if you're integrated with cor the course, consider linking or embedding it in Canvas, as well as making an announcement about it, um, making sure the teacher understands how to use it, how their students are gonna use it. And we do have something in Lib Insights, if you're in ROI, that you can fill out a digital object creation form. And then it lets me know that you want it to go on the library tutorials guide, uh, which are really library tutorials that we use often uh, in our instruction about research. And so now you've created a video, now what? So again, I'm heading towards the end, but again, there's no good in like having a video if no one watches it, if people watch it and hate it. Um, again, I don't think I'm better than this. Like I think I've definitely made uh, bad videos that people don't watch. So again, assessing them, thinking about like, did they work? What did they not work? What did they, what did, not what did not work about them uh, is going to be key. So just, I only have one slide on this, but um, some things to think about is analytics from YouTube, LibGuides, and Canvas. All three of these tools, if you're like, again, providing these multiple points of making them findable, provide you analytics. YouTube has those watch counts, which, you know, they don't really tell you when people left, you know, or if they only watched half of it, but Canvas Studio um, does. So Canvas Studio has better analytics than YouTube. They show you when students dropped out. They showed you if students were skipping parts. Um, so again, if you're like doing something with a course, Canvas Studio provides you much better analytics. So um, course integrated assessment, of course, if you're um, doing a, co a course video, you can do final product assessment after your students view a video. You can do a follow-up survey or form where the video is mentioned in course evaluations. You can do, um, you know, that kind of thing. That would also work with the training, right? Like having a survey follow up with the students who you're training or the patrons that you're training, uh, et cetera. So again, there's like tons of articles about this. I'm not gonna harp on it. But again, just remember that uh, it's important to kind of check in on once in a while. Okay, so we covered a lot of stuff today, but here are kind of an overview of all the links that have a lot of the stuff I went to. So there's the library instructional tech guide. So all those trainings that I talked about that we've been doing for the last three years are all on that guide. It's the same guide I sent out um, when we started working from home, where we create a work from home um, tab. But a lot of these tools I talked about have more detailed guides on there. And this will eventually be linked on there, because again, we're kind of doing this combo lib instructional tech training and um, other things. So we also have an instructional tech toolkit um, before my time uh, it was created and uh, it has just overall instructional tech resources at UNCG. But if you haven't looked at it in a while, I did update it. It has accurate and current information on um, different points of contact in ITS, ITCs across campus, the UTLC, um, and also links to a lot of these free tools and UNCG supported tools, trainings, or their actual um, website if you want to go direct directly to them. We also have, again, that training on free screen recording tools that I did that was an hour. And I also put the links to the Digital Media Commons and Digital Act Studios in here. I mean, we all know them. They're our friends. Uh, but just to clarify the difference, in case you don't know, the Digital Media Commons can help you with the, like, how-to of creating a video. And they might be a better fit than me to, like, give you, like, a tutorial on how to edit a video uh, with a lot of these tools we talked about. Whereas the Digital Act Studio helps you with, like, the aesthetics of the um, video, like the design of it. 
So then um, the last one is that uh, I did a training for ROI earlier, what is time? I think last week <laughs> on online learning, sink or swim. So this presentation takes you through some things to think about with online learning and creating these kinds of asynchronous online learning objects. So if you decide that maybe after this, uh, a video is not for you, that you want to look at other options, you want to provide something with links, you want to create something with engagement, uh, you want to try something more textual, uh, something that can be more easily changed, right, if the interface changes, that's going to be a great place to start because it lists a lot of other tools besides like video tools and again consideration for asynchronous learning overall well, it was a sprint but we made it <laughs> again sorry that I talked fast but here we are so are there any questions or concerns yep Maggie y'all can turn your mics on if you want I was just about to ask if I could do that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I teach a class, um, and last semester I tried to keep my weekly lectures short so that they, you know, were not sort of longer than a best practice video, along with other, you know, lots of other content. But the the students uh, in my course evaluations. Um, so that they wanted longer lectures. You think that it would make sense to have a series of videos? For yeah, I mean that that might have been specific to that class. Yeah, yeah. You always do one short and then you know do a quick assessment right after and be like, do y'all want more or less? Like, more yeah, yeah, like that, like that particular class roster. You mean like? Yeah, they, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So like it is, um, you know. Uh, Thing. And then yeah, someone just chatted me privately and said they saw lunch nap show up. Just to be clear, I have a two-year-old. So <laughs> that is what that means. I <laughs> nap today. Um, so anyway, um, so yeah, does that make sense, Maggie? And like, it does. Yeah, no, that, that I mean, that's like, a great idea. So that's right say, at the well, beginning. I really liked this video, but I wanted more detail. So then you'll know before you create really longer lectures. That's a great. I, I appreciate uh, this perspective because I was going to spend the summer recording longer lectures, but I like this idea better. <laughs> yeah, I would do that. I mean, you could do a couple longer lectures this summer. And yeah. On feedback, cut them up. That's smart. Yep. To me, That's I smart. always, I, what I usually do when I do anything is I actually plan a pretty long video with like everything and then I like record it. And then once I like watch it through the whole 10 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever, I think about like, well, how can I chunk this up? How can I like think about like, you know, what is necessary? That kind yeah. of, thing. you know, your instructor might have, a, you know, be like, see, that's another thing I didn't, you know, because we're not all like ROI librarians, sometimes instructors are like, no, I want a 15 minute video. Yeah, yeah. And I always kind of just cave to their wants. But remember, if you make a 15 minute video about how to like use PubMed or whatever, you can chunk it up later. That's true. Yeah, and I always- It can always be done after, you know? Yeah. I always make a point of using transition slides. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that I can think of that as like, maybe this was is where I would chunk it if I had to. Yeah, and I was gonna show you like, um, well, let me think. Um, I made this eight minute video um, for this information literacy stipend project uh, with a public health class. So like here's a way I use Google Slides to create a title, right? So I used like UNCG branding and this was like my intro slide, right? Like we're gonna go into searching strategies for annotated um, bibliographies. Um, and then I had a uh, like infographics that I went over, you know, that I could show up in the video, right, and kind of like, you know, zoom in on different parts that I was talking about. Um, and then uh, this kind of stuff, you know, like I had them go through these kind of things. So you can use, again, these different tools to show concepts within a video. Does that make sense? Um, so that's an example. And I don't, I'm not going to make y'all watch the eight minute video. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I just realized that I'm not muted. Sorry. I meant to mute myself after. I, yeah, I, so someone uh, said they have to go. Bye. Um, so yeah. All right. Are there any other questions? And again, you all can talk about specific stories. Um, it's okay. 
I was just going to let people know that I went ahead and linked your slides from the ULVLC LibGuide, Sam. Mm -hmm. um, so they're on there. Um, oh, no. Thanks, Maggie, for that. Um, so there we go. Better. better. Um, so the slides are on there, even though the video is not on there yet. So if anyone wanted to go and explore those links, things like that, um, please feel free to do that. Yeah. Great. And then um, an example, I'll show this really fast. I mean, not like show it. I'll drop it in the chat. Y'all can watch it later. But um, here's an example of what I was talking about of something that I cut up um, actual screen recordings with Paltoons, if you wanted to see an example of that. Um, so do y'all hear that? Not really. Okay, fine. It's fine. You don't need to hear it. But here you see like an animation. This is what Paltoons does, right? It's like someone talking about like that they want to like get organized in their research and like, but they're nervous about citations. They're going to ask a librarian and then it flows, see, into like an actual how to about Zotero, right? Where like I show, I screen record and have call outs. So this is an example again of how you can kind of merge two things together. You don't have to necessarily pick one or the other. Okay, so that's enough. But I just want to show you that that's an example of Paltoons in case people are like, what are you talking about with Paltoons? Okay, are there any other questions? I haven't seen any other questions come up, but um, I did, uh, as you all know, um, put the, yes, there's, there's the link from Sam in the chat. I put the link to the assessment form in the chat. We really appreciate when you can fill that out. And I just want to say thank you so much to Sam. I think this was great. Um, and it's definitely something that I think we can all go back to later and take a look at um, the different resources that you provided. So thanks a bunch, Sam. Um, and if there are no other questions, I will just say thanks to all of you for attending. Y'all are awesome. Um, and uh, keep uh, stay tuned. There will be ULVLC sessions next week. And like Sam mentioned, coming up in a couple weeks, there will also be another one of these kind of partnership sessions where Sam's going to talk about making online learning and training more engaging. So be on the lookout. And yeah, that's it. I hope everyone has an awesome day. And I guess I can have already stopped recording, but I didn't. Um, so